Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen Pally. Welcome to this special omnibus edition of Journey with Story. And in this special omnibus episode, you can listen to all four stories for this month, one after the other. And just so you know, there will be no special intro for the individual stories, no added details and no shout outs. If you want to hear all of those, then you need to go and listen to the individual episode and not this version. Got it? Oh, mums and dads and grown-ups, you can download some free colouring sheets at www.journeywithstory.com. A big thank you to all of you who wrote reviews for my new picture book, Five Little Angels. And congratulations to all the winners of our contest. Be sure and check out our Instagram page to see a list of our winners and the fun prizes that they won. And don't worry if you didn't win a prize this time. We will be having some fun summertime contests for podcast-related prizes too. Let's take an Omnibus Journey with Story. Let's take a journey with the Story Bag. Long ago, there once lived a very wealthy family who had only one child, a little boy who loved to hear stories. Whenever he met a new person, he would say, Please, can you tell me a new story? And each time, he would tuck away that story in a small bag he carried on his belt. After some time, he had heard so many, many stories that his bag was bulging and he had to push hard to cram each new story inside. Then, to make sure that none of the stories escaped, he kept the bag very tightly shut. Years passed, and the boy eventually grew into a fine young man. It was time for him now to marry, and so the family chose a bride for him. For days the household was in an uproar, making preparations to welcome the young master's new wife. Now it happened that in this wealthy household, There was a faithful old servant who had lived with the family ever since this story-loving boy was a baby. As the other servants were preparing for the wedding, this old servant tended the fire on the kitchen hearth. Suddenly, he heard a faint whispering sound coming from somewhere. He listened carefully, and to his amazement, he discovered the voices were coming from a bag hanging on the wall. It was the bag of stories which the young master had kept when he was a child. The old servant leaned in closer to listen. Listen carefully, said a voice. The boy's wedding is to take place tomorrow. He has kept us this long while stuffed in this bag, packed so closely and uncomfortably together. We have suffered for a long time, and now we must make him pay for this some way or another. Yes, said another voice. I have been thinking the same thing. Tomorrow the young man will ride away on his horse to bring home his bride. I shall change into bright red berries ripening by the roadside. There I shall wait for him and will look so beautiful that he will be sure to want to eat me. But he will not know that I shall be poisonous. He will wish he had never eaten me. And if he doesn't eat the berries, chimed a third voice, that I shall become a clear bubbling spring by the roadside. I shall have a beautiful copper cup floating in me. When he sees me, he will feel thirsty and he will drink me. And I will make him wish He had never drunk from me. A fourth voice then piped up. If you both fail, then I shall become an iron skewer, heated red hot, and I shall hide in the bag of straw that will be placed by his horse while he will dismount. When he steps on me, I shall scotch his feet. 
Then a fifth voice whispered, And if all that fails, then I shall become a poisonous string of snakes, thin as threads. I shall hide in the bridal chamber when the bride and groom fall asleep. I shall slither out and... Now, when the faithful old servant heard all these terrible threats, he was filled with alarm. Oh, how dreadful, he said. I must protect my young master. When he leaves the house tomorrow, I will take the bridle and lead his horse myself. So early the next morning, as the final preparations were completed, the wedding procession set forth. The groom, dressed in all his finery, came out of the house and mounted his horse. At once the faithful servant charged forward and grabbed the horse's bridle, asking if he could lead the horse. But the old master of the house said, You have work to do here. I want you to stay behind. The faithful servant did not give up. But I must lead the horse today, he insisted. I don't care what anyone says. I must take the bridle. The old master was surprised by the old man's obstinacy, and in the end he relented and agreed to let him do as he asked. After a short while, the procession came to an open field, and there by the roadside grew many bright red berries. Wait, wait, cried the bridegroom. Stop the horse and pick me some of those juicy berries. But the servant paid no heed to his master. Instead, he hurried the horse to trot faster, saying, Oh, those berries are not special. You can find them anywhere. Be patient and I shall pick some for you later. A little further along the road they came to a bubbling stream. The water looked so cool and refreshing, and there was even a copper cup bobbing on the water. Quick, bring me a cup of that water, demanded the bridegroom. I am parched with thirst. But again the servant just prodded the horse and hurried by. Once we get into the shade of those trees, your thirst will pass. The bridegroom grumbled and complained. His mood turned sour and nasty. But the servant paid him no heed. He made the horse go even faster now, and soon enough, they reached the bride's home. There, already gathered outside, was a huge crowd of people. The servant led the horse into the compound and stopped it beside the mound of hay. As the bridegroom put down his foot to dismount, the servant pretended to stumble and shoved the bridegroom to keep him from stepping on the bale of hay. The bridegroom toppled over and fell onto the straw mats laid out on the ground. He blushed with shame at his clumsiness, but he dared not scold the servant in front of all these people, so he kept his silence and entered the bride's home. Inside, a grand ceremony was held with a lavish feast and much rejoicing and then the newly married couple returned to the groom's home. That night, when the couple retired to their room, the servant armed himself with a sword, and he hid himself under the veranda outside the bridal chamber. As soon as he saw the couple had turned out their lights, the servant opened the door and leapt inside. <gasps> Who's there? Who's there? shouted the couple, startled by such an intrusion. Young master! the servant said. I shall explain later, but right now, hurry and get out of the way. Then the servant, kicking the bedding aside, lifted the mattress and uncovered a terrible sight, a writhing nest of snakes. But one slash from the servant's sharp sword was enough to slay them all. With a great sigh of relief, the servant turned to the couple and began. Young master, this is the story. And he recounted all the whispers that he had heard coming from the old bag on the kitchen wall. And that is why, when stories are heard, they must never be stored away, lest they become mean and spiteful. Instead, they must always be shared with other people. In this way, they are passed from one person to another so that as many people as possible can enjoy them. A 
Let's take a journey with the Frog Prince. Long ago, one warm summer's day, a young princess put on her bonnet and shoes and went for a walk by herself in the forest nearby. Soon she came to an old lime tree, and under that tree was a deep well, and next to the tree was a cool fountain. And so the princess sat down to rest by the fountain, and to pass the time she took out a golden ball from her pocket. It was her favourite plaything. Again and again she tossed it up, up into the air, catching it deftly each time it fell. But after a while she threw it up so high that she wasn't able to catch it when it fell. The ball bounced away and rolled upon the ground right into the well. The princess ran over and peered into the well, but the ball had vanished and the well was deep, so deep, that she could not even see the bottom of it. At once she began to wail and weep. Then she heard a voice saying, What troubles you, dear princess? You are weeping so pitifully. She looked around to the side from where the voice came and saw a frog stretching forth its thick, ugly head from the water. Oh, old water splasher, is it you? she said. I am weeping for my golden ball which has fallen into the well. Be quiet and do not weep, answered the frog. I can't help you, but what will you give me if I bring you your plaything? Whatever you will have, dear frog, she said. My clothes, my pearls and jewels and even the golden crown which I am wearing. The frog answered, I do not care for clothes or pearls or jewels or even your golden crown. But if you will love me and let me be your companion and playfellow and sit by you at your table and eat off your little golden plate and drink out of your little cup and sleep in your little bed, if you will promise me this, I will go down below and bring you your golden ball. Oh, yes, agreed the princess. I promise all you wish if you will only bring me my ball back again. However, to herself, the princess thought... How this silly frog does talk. He lives in the water with the other frogs and croaks and can be no companion to any human being. But on hearing her promise, the frog put his head into the water and sank down and in a short while came swimming up again with the ball in his mouth and threw it on the grass. Delighted to see her pretty plaything once more, the princess picked it up and ran away with it. Wait, wait, said the frog. Take me with you. I can't run as fast as you. But the princess paid him no heed and the poor frog had to climb back into his well again. The next day, when the princess was eating dinner with her father, the king, she heard something come creeping. the marble staircase and when it got to the top it knocked at the door and cried princess dear princess open the door for me at once she ran to see who was outside and when she opened the door there sat the frog in front of it it gave her such a fright that she at once slammed the door in his face and went back to the dinner table (gasps) seeing how afraid she was her father the king asked her Whatever is the matter, my child, who is at the door? A nasty, disgusting frog, she replied. What does a frog want with you? asked the king. Oh, dear father, yesterday, as I was in the forest sitting by the well playing, my golden ball fell into the water, and because I cried so, the frog brought it out again for me, and because he so insisted, I promised him he should be my companion. But I never thought he'd be able to come out of his water. And now he is outside there and wants to come in to me. Now, as she was speaking, the frog knocked a second time, crying. Princess, open the door for me. Do you not remember what you said to me yesterday by the fountain? Open the door for me. Then said the king, that which you have promised you must do. Go and let him in. So the princess did as her father commanded. She went and opened the door, and the frog hopped in and followed her, step by step, to her chair. There he sat and cried, 
Lift me up beside you. At first the princess refused, but at last the king again commanded she do what she had promised. But no sooner was the frog on the chair than he demanded to be put on the table. Now push your little golden plate nearer to me that we may eat together, he said. Reluctantly the princess did this. She watched with disgust as the frog enjoyed every single morsel of his food. When he had eaten his fill, the frog said, I have eaten and am satisfied. Now I'm tired. Carry me into your little room and make your little silken bed ready and we will both lie down and go to sleep. The princess began to cry, for she was afraid of the cold frog and his slimy skin and could not bear the thought of sleeping with him in her clean little bed. But the king grew angry and he said, He helped you when you were in trouble. You should not dare now to despise him. So the princess took hold of the frog with two fingers, carried him upstairs and put him in a corner. When she was in bed, he crept to her and said, I am tired. I want to sleep as well as you. Lift me up or I will tell your father. The princess squirmed as she bent down low, picked up the frog and laid him on the pillow in her bed where she slept all night long. As soon as it was light, the frog jumped up, hopped downstairs and rushed out of the house. Now then, thought the princess, at last he is gone and I shall be troubled with him no more. But she was mistaken, for when night came again she heard the same tapping at the door, and the frog came once more and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to your true love here, and mind the words that you and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. And when the princess opened the door, in came the frog and slept upon her pillow as before, till the morning broke. And the third night he did the same. But when the princess awoke on the following morning, she was astonished to see, instead of the frog, a handsome prince gazing upon her with the most beautiful eyes she had ever seen, and standing at the head of her bed. Then the prince told her his story. That he had been enchanted by a spiteful fairy who had changed him into a frog and told him he must stay as a frog until some princess should rescue him from the water and allow him to eat from her plate and sleep upon her bed for three nights. Now you have broken this cruel spell said the prince, and now I have nothing to wish for but that you should go with me into my father's kingdom where I will marry you and love you as long as you live. And of course the young princess agreed at once and as they spoke a golden coach pulled up the drive with eight beautiful horses decked with plumes of feathers and a sparkling harness and behind the coach rode the prince's servant, faithful Henry who had long waited for this day to see his master freed from this dreadful spell. And so they set off for the prince's kingdom where they were married amidst great rejoicing and there they lived in great peace and contentment for all the years of their lives. Let's take a journey with the White Crane. Long ago in Japan, there lived a poor fisherman and his wife. Every day the fisherman rose before the first blush of dawn and went out onto the lake in his boat to fish. But each day he barely caught enough fish to feed him and his wife. One day, just as the fisherman was about to give up and return home, he spotted a beautiful white crane at the edge of the marsh, flapping its wings wildly. He paddled his boat over to the crane 
and saw that it was caught up in an old net some careless fisherman had left there. You are so beautiful, whispered the fisherman as he tried to catch hold of the net. Hold still, let me cut you free. The crane stood still and allowed the fisherman to cut the net away. When it broke free, it flapped his wings, circled the mist-covered lake and flew right over the fisherman's head as if to say, Thank you for setting me free. Later that evening, the fisherman brought his day's catch of fish to his wife for her to cook for their evening meal. After they had eaten, they sat for a while by the fire chatting about this and that. They were content in every way but one. They had long wished for a son or a daughter to keep them company, but this wish had never been granted. Suddenly, a sharp knock on the door startled them. The fisherman opened the door and there stood a beautiful girl with long black hair dressed in a flowing white kimono. The couple invited her inside to warm herself by the fire. After they chatted for a while, the girl told them that she was an orphan with no home and no one to love or be loved by, and so at once they insisted she must spend the night with them. In the morning, the old couple awoke to find the girl had cooked breakfast, straightened all the mats in the house, and cleaned up all the pots and dishes in the sink. They were so delighted, they told her, If we had a daughter, we would want her to be just like you. The girl smiled and told them, Since I have no parents, I will be your daughter, and I will mind you as you grow old. For many weeks and many months, the old couple and the young girl lived in great peace and contentment. Every day the old man went off to fish for their supper in the lake. Every day the old woman went to work in the fields. And every day while they were both gone, the young girl went to the loom in the weaving room, and there she wove for hours on end. Sometimes when the couple came home they found her still weaving away in the room but she had warned them both that they must never ever look in on her while she was weaving for she wanted this to be a surprise for them and the old couple did as she had asked even though they could barely contain their curiosity. Now when market day was almost upon them the young girl brought out the beautiful bolt of cloth she had been weaving. She held it up to the light, and the silky fabric shimmered with tiny threads of silver glistening like the mist on the lake at sunrise. Its beauty filled the room, and the couple were speechless with amazement. Take this to the market and sell it so that you will have money for food during the long, harsh winter, the girl told them. So the old man set off for the village market carrying the beautiful bolt of cloth. Along the way, each neighbour who saw him asked about the cloth, admired it and told them how much he should charge. One said, Oh, you should charge ten gold coins for a cloth as silky as this. Another said, No, you must charge fifty gold coins for a cloth that has these lovely silver threads running through it. And yet another said, No, no, poor fisherman, a cloth as beautiful as the mist on the lake is surely worth one hundred gold coins, enough to last for many harsh winters. And so it happened that the fisherman sold the cloth for one hundred gold coins. The old couple could not believe their good fortune. Now they had enough money for food for many, many winters, but most important of all, they were blessed with a beautiful daughter to keep them company in their old age. Time passed, and every day the young girl still went to work in the weaving room, and every day she reminded the old couple that on no account were they to peek inside while she was weaving. Curious as they were, the old couple agreed to do as she had asked. But one day, a meddlesome neighbour came to visit. She had seen the old couple's good fortune and was eager to know more about their beautiful young daughter. She plied them with one question after another about the girl, and so the old couple invited their neighbour to join them for dinner. As they ate, the couple shared all the blessings they had enjoyed since their beautiful young daughter had come to live with them. 
How wonderful it will be now to have a daughter who will care for us in her old age, said the old woman. And the neighbour smiled and nodded in agreement. But then she asked if she could meet this beautiful daughter of theirs. How I would love to see this beauty for myself, she said. No, that is not possible, said the fisherman. She is weaving now in her room and no one is allowed to look in on her while she weaves. Oh, surely I can take just a little peek, said the neighbour as she pushed past them and opened the door a crack. And there she saw. A beautiful white crane plucking out white feathers and turning them into soft, silky white cloth as delicate as mist on the lake. Then, in one instant, poof, the crane disappeared. A few moments later, the beautiful young girl came out of the room, holding a half-finished length of cloth whose strands were frayed and falling apart. Her eyes full of tears, the girl said, I am sorry you did not remember the rule. Thank you for freeing me from the net. I wanted to stay with you as your daughter and comfort you in your old age, but alas, now, the spell is broken. I must return to my home in the misty lake. And before their eyes, the beautiful young girl turned into a white crane. And with a flap of her wings, off she flew. From that day, the old man and his wife managed to scrape by, living off the money the beautiful bolt of cloth had brought them. But every now and then, the couple went out on the boat on the lake, and sometimes they would catch sight of the beautiful white crane as it circled the mist-covered lake. And sometimes it would flap its wings and fly right over their heads as if to say, See, I am still here watching over you. Do not be sad. I am still here. Let's take a journey with Delgadina. There once was a little girl called Delgadina who found a tiny red snake in the forest near her home. So enchanted was she with her little snake that she made a beautiful painted box for him and spent all day long playing with him. At night she slipped the box beneath her bed and in the morning she saw that the snake had grown three times as big. This must be a magic snake, her mother told her. You must take very good care of it. Day by day, Delgadina tended to her snake, and day by day it grew bigger and bigger until soon he filled the whole room. Now, even although the snake was so enormous, Delgadina was not the least bit afraid of him, and never did the snake do her one bit of harm. But day by day, the snake continued to grow bigger and bigger, until one day, Delgadina's mother said, Oh, my dearest girl, your snake is too big to stay with us any longer. He must go and live in the forest. And so the snake slithered out of the house and off into the forest. Delgadina followed him and watched as he slid into the mouth of a cave. Every day, Delgadina went to visit him and fed him all sorts of tasty morsels. 
And so the snake continued to grow bigger and bigger until one day Delgadina's mother said, Oh, we are just too poor to feed this snake any longer. I'm afraid he will not leave us unless you send him away, Delgadina. But surely he will be happier anyway to live among his own kind with the other snakes and water creatures. Delgadina's eyes filled with tears and yet she knew her mother spoke the truth and so she called out, Come, my little red snake, come. At once the snake slithered his way to the mouth of the cave and to her amazement he spoke in a gentle human voice. Delgadina, what do you want? he asked. My mother says we are too poor to feed you and you must go and live in the ocean, but I shall miss you, dear snake. Do not be sad, said the snake. Your mother is right. It is time for me to go. But before I do, let me give you a gift. Take your hands and rub them on my eyes three times. Delgadina did as the snake had asked. Now, Delgadina, whenever you wash your hands and shake your fingers dry, golden coins will fall from your hands. Thank you, dear snake, said Delgadina. And sadly, she watched him slither away toward the ocean. Many years passed. Because of the snake's gift, Delgadina and her mother became wealthy and wanted for nothing. And they were as generous as they were rich, sharing their good fortune with all who were in need. And so it was that the snake's gift blessed all those who lived near and around the forest by Delgadina's home. Not far from there lived a king who was looking for a queen. He had heard all about this beautiful girl who could shake golden coins from her fingers and whose heart was kind and good. This young woman would make an excellent queen, he said to himself, and he wondered how he could set up a meeting with her. Now, also in this kingdom there lived an old woman who was wicked and jealous and hated both the snake and Delgadina. When she heard that the king was interested in meeting Delgadina, she went to him and said, I know Delgadina's mother well. If you give me a golden coach with four white horses and a dress of diamond and pearls, I will bring Delgadina to you. And at once the king eagerly agreed, for he did not know this woman had an evil heart. Now, of course, the old woman had no intention of giving the coach and the dress to Delgadina. Instead, she gave everything to her own daughter, planning that she should become the queen and not Delgadina. So she dressed her daughter in the beautiful dress of diamonds and pearls. Then she sat in the golden carriage, hid under a cloak the colour of night, and drove off to Delgadina's house. When Delgadina's mother saw the shining carriage with the four horses coming up the path, she assumed it was coming from the king's palace, and she ran outside to make it welcome. The old woman shouted from the carriage, The king wants to marry your daughter. Delgadina's mother was overjoyed, and Delgadina happily agreed to this wedding, for she had heard that the king was kind and good and generous. And so she made herself ready and climbed into the carriage. But as her mother was about to step in behind her, the old woman slammed the door in her face and screeched, Not now! We will come back for you later! And so poor Delgadina had to wave her mother farewell as the carriage sped off. But in a little while, Delgadina realised they were not headed toward the king's palace, but in the opposite direction, up a winding road to the edge of the cliffs that overlooked the sea. And in the dark shadows of the coach, she barely could notice a scraggly girl covered in a black cloak sitting opposite her. Delgadina banged on the door of the carriage, asking the old woman to stop. But the wicked woman paid her no heed and instead goaded the horses to gallop faster and faster until they reached the very top of the cliffs. There the old woman stopped the carriage, unlocked the door, dragged Delgadina out and carried her to the edge of the cliff where she shoved her into the sea.
Then she hurried back to the carriage and set off for the palace, planning to bring her own daughter for the king to marry. Everyone in the kingdom was making ready for a royal wedding. Bright banners flapped from the rooftops. People sang and danced in the streets as the chapel bells rang out. The servants had prepared a lavish feast and a long crimson rug had been spread out from the palace all the way down to the road. Out of the carriage stepped the wicked woman's daughter and up to the palace she marched. But when the king caught sight of his bride, he gasped in astonishment, for he had heard much about her beauty, and this girl in front of him was no beauty. Still, he said to himself, if she is as kind as I have heard, then I will marry her, for true beauty is within and not without. Yet I must know the truth. If she can shake gold from her fingers, then I will know for certain that she is the real Delgadina. And so he said to her, my dear girl, after your long journey, I am sure you will want to wash your hands before the ceremony. But the wicked woman knew what the king was trying to do, and she said, No, no, there is no need. We wash our hands in the clearest of streams in the forest. And so the king, not wanting to cause offence, went ahead with the wedding. The next day he watched the girl wash her hands, and when no gold coins fell from her fingers when she shook them dry... He silently rejoiced, for now he knew for certain this was not Delgadina, and he could get rid of her. But the girl raged at him and shouted, Oh, now look what has happened! I managed you and all my magic has disappeared. It is your fault! The king was speechless and did not know how to make this girl go away, and so they remained married. In the meantime... The real Delgadina was still alive. She had been washed ashore on an island where an old shepherd had found her and given her shelter. Day after day the shepherd tended to her, for she was very ill and she had lost her sight. Little by little she grew stronger, but still she could not see and nor could she make gold fall from her fingers. She was heartbroken, too sad even to tell the shepherd her story and what had happened to her. Every morning she went down to the shore and she turned to feel the breeze on her skin and she sang a sad song to her mother. I wish I could go home again. My mother I would see. For she is very far away. Somewhere across the sea. Now one day Delgadina heard a sound from the waves, a voice calling her name, Delgadina. She knew that voice, for she had heard it before. It was her beloved snake. She stretched out her hand to stroke his face, saying, oh, How happy I am to hear your voice, my dear friend. And she told him all that had happened to her. The red snake said, Do not be sad. I can make things right again. Take your hands and rub them on my eyes three times. Now, press your hands on your own eyes. Delgadina did as the snake told her, and when she lifted her hands from her eyes, she could see again. Then the snake said, Now, wash your hands and shake the shepherd up pile of gold to last him his whole life. Gladly Delgadina did so. Then she thanked the shepherd and bid him farewell. She climbed onto the back of the snake and he carried her across the sea back to her mother. When mother and daughter were united there was great rejoicing and it did not take long for the happy news to spread far and wide. Soon even the king heard the news, and at once he determined he must now prove to everyone that his bride was not Delgadina, for he could not bear to be married to her any longer. He announced that he was going to hold a special feast, and he invited everyone in Chile. He ordered his cooks to fry the greasiest of foods and arranged with his servants not to supply any towels so anyone who washed their hands would have to shake them dry and the one who shook gold from her fingers 
would be his Delgadina. And so it was that everyone in the land arrived at the feast, including Delgadina and her mother. All the guests enjoyed eating the food, but it was so greasy that they had to wash their hands after and then shake their fingers dry. And of course, when Delgadina did so, the gold coins poured to the ground. The king let out a hope of delight. The wicked woman and her daughter fumed with rage. And the soldiers were too busy eating to notice. The old woman and her daughter fled. But they took with them the golden carriage, as much treasure as they could carry, and the diamond dress. <laughs> the king did not care, for he was so glad to be rid of them. But then he stamped his feet three times on the ground. He stamped so hard that the earth shook all the way down to the ocean where the red snake slept. Waking, the snake peered up and saw the wicked woman's carriage charging down the road. He buried a hole beneath the earth until he was directly under the carriage and then he wriggled and poked and turned and twisted until he was able to rear up and blow with all his might. Up, up, up into the air the carriage was thrown, spinning and whirling until... With one loud pop, it vanished, never to be seen again. And that evening, Delgadina and the king were married. From that day forward, whenever they had a problem, they would stamp three times in the earth and call for the snake. Delgadina would place a small crown on his head, and the snake would advise them. Delgadina and the king and the snake ruled the kingdom with wealth wisdom and kindness and so everyone lived in great peace and contentment I hope you enjoyed that special omnibus edition of Journey with Story and if you're looking for some ideas for further follow up activities maybe you can discuss what the story souvenir was for each story. Remember, the story souvenir is just that little glimmer of truth about what it means to be human and live in this world. Maybe you can make a drawing of your favourite episode and send it to me on Instagram at Journey with Story or on our website. Oh, and another activity that a lot of mums have shared with me their kids like to do is after listening to an episode a few times children like to act it out so you could get your brothers or your sisters or your friends together and put on a little play for your mums and dads to lighten their day oh and mums and dads you can get some other ideas for activities and storytelling resources from me if you sign up for my newsletter at www.journeywithstory.com and if you subscribe to our patreon page you can enjoy even more perks and resources Here's to stories aplenty that fill our hearts with grace and goodness, hope and light, so that we remember, as my favourite poet says, All shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Be well, my friends, be well, and join me next time for Journey with Story. Music and post-production was by Colette Jonas. <laughs>